different kinds of rural investments and programs, be they youth specific or not, serve the interests of young people, and critically, of which young people? Here, the call is for a more action-oriented or action-research approach. These programs represent, I think, important research and learning opportunities. And this potential for learning cannot simply be left to a midterm or a final evaluation. Let me reflect or finish by reflecting on what this might mean for the future. So can we use a kind of foresight lens to help us frame research relating to youth and agriculture? Well, even without doing any formal foresight work, it seems to me possible, impossible to escape the conclusion that over the coming decades, the transformation of agriculture in Africa is likely to be characterized by some degree of consolidation, by changes in, in and greater use of technology, and by increasing mechanization. These processes will be linked to the growth of urban markets and changes in where food is purchased prepared and consumed, with an increasing priority given, of course, to food safety, uniformity, and standards more generally. Of course, we should not forget that these developments will unfold in different ways and at different speeds in different areas. So within this overall scenario, the lived experience and the opportunity sets available to young people Will vary, very, will vary significantly. Nevertheless, a number of important implications arise that are directly relevant to our interest in young people from an agricultural research perspective. First, it should be expected that agricultural and rural transformation along the lines I've just mentioned will result in a decline in the demand for labor at farm level. In other words, there will be fewer and fewer on-farm opportunities for young people, or indeed for anyone. To put it in another way, from an employment perspective, the part of the agricultural system that institutes like IITA have traditionally focused on will progressively shrink from an employment perspective. And for the jobs that do remain, the balance will shift from independent farm operators to wage labor. And if what we've seen in other parts of the world is any indication, the quality of many of these uh, agriculture-related jobs that remain in rural areas will, far, will fall well short of any standard of decent work. On the other hand, there will certainly be growth in other parts of the food system. But many, if not most, of these associated employment opportunities are unlikely to be in rural areas. Here we must also be concerned about the quality of these new jobs. We need to remember that catering, fast food, and food retail are notorious in terms of the poor terms and conditions of work that they provide. Are these the kinds of jobs upon which future generations of increasingly educated young Africans are going to have to build their careers? But you might ask, what about the ancillary jobs in the rural economy that I mentioned earlier? Again, with a reduced agricultural workforce, one might expect to see the kinds of hollowed out rural areas and rural economies that we've seen in emerging, that we've seen emerge in other parts of the world. There is, of course, the alternative vision that Emile so well sketched out today, which is built around concerns like agroecology and food sovereignty, local food and local control, reduction in food miles, an emphasis on provenance, quality, and so on. I think if this is taken seriously, this scenario would have really important implications for things like farm structure, technology use, labor demand, and the nature of rural economies, and of course, the shape of urban food systems. I ask a question. Should radical alternatives like this be part of the youth and agriculture research agenda? For me, today, the really big question is how agriculture and food might fit in to a future where economic and social policy are 
driven, are really driven, by a vision of decent work for all. What we might think of as a decent work rural economy. And how might such an economy serve the needs and interests of young people and others? Well, I'll just finish by saying that with the renewed commitment to interdisciplinary research and the kinds of systems analysis that Ken's pointed to today, I really believe that IITA and institutes like it have an extremely important role to play in furthering our understanding along the lines I've laid out. And I encourage you, as strongly as I possibly can, to take up this challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. That was a very thoughtful analysis of the issue, and I'm sure it will raise a number of interesting points uh, for discussion. So I encourage uh, you to put down any issues. And um, it's not only just even asking a question against one point or the other point, but there may be alternative viewpoints that can also be expressed when we get to the point of discussion. I guess one thing that I take home is the fact that the whole issue of youth in ag agriculture is not simple. And we need to really look at it in a broader context of uh, complexities out there. And, and of course, there are several elements that we will discuss later on. OK, so let's move to the third presentation. And this one is taking us to the whole issue of how are we safeguarding the world's um, gene banks, the biological resources, etc. And uh, we have with us Charlotte Lusty. Charlotte coordinates the CGIAR gene bank platform, which brings together the work of the 11 CGIAR center gene banks under one program supporting their everyday operations and collective work towards their improvement and use. She is a senior scientist at the Global Crop Diversity Trust, working there since 2008. She led the Gene Bank CRP and was responsible for putting in place the structure and elements that underpin the new platform. She has worked previously at Bioversity International and the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center, coordinating global projects on the conservation and use of plant genetic diversity. Her career started in zoology, graduating from Edinburgh University, and working with the Jane Goodall Institute in Tanzania. Uh, before, before Charlotte begins, I'd like to request we all stand just stand for a while. Yeah. <coughs> and your hands up a bit and move it one way down and back again there. Excellent. Now we can sit down. We make sure our genetic resource is well kept. <laughs> As Charlotte. <laughs> Okay, shalom. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kwesi. And it's a great privilege to be here representing the Global Crop Diversity Trust and the, and the Gene Bank platform. I've, uh, I'm very privileged to be among your, the em eminent speakers that you've, uh, that you've uh, selected today. I've really enjoyed the, the talks up until now, so thank you very much. So, uh, transformation. We've heard... Agriculture must transform, I think every speaker said the same. Uh, and the figures are that 60% that 60, 60 increased production is needed by 2050 to keep up with population increase. And that's needed in the context of climate change, so increased abiotic stresses and pests and diseases. And at the same time, agriculture has a great responsibility to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that it produces. And as 
Bruce told us earlier today, um, a, a significant event was happening just earlier this year uh, in the COP23, hosted in Fiji. I don't think, I don't know how many of you have been to Fiji, but that is not Fiji in the photo. In fact, this is where I come from. This is, this is Bonn, and here I am with uh, my colleague and friend, Yanni Van Beem, who you may know. She used to work in SIP. Now she works with us. And that poor polar bear is the depiction of where we are or where we are going to be. Very grim sight. And it's sitting on top of a, I think that is a, an oil pipe, in the shape of one of those dramatic curves, I believe it might be, emissions. So that was, that was the flavour of where I was before I came here. Very, very, very eminent, um, evident need for change. Now, I think all the previous speakers have done me a great favour in illustrating very amply why plant genetic resources are key to that change. There are so many aspects where they are important, whether it's in soil management or water use, in uh, pest and disease management, and I'm talking at the agroecological level, as Emil has pointed out, but there's also a, a species level where specific species have a very important function. And then, of course, and this is where we touch upon the focus of my talk, is the variation within species that is so important. And a lot of hopes are generated by that magical trait that might be found in uh, interspecific uh, variation. And, and there's a good reason for that. The, the Green Revolution, of course, a, a large part of uh, the yield gains that uh, were um, experienced in the Green Le Revolution were from two genes, in, in, for instance, in, uh, um, in rice from the Norin uh, variety, where, where they've actually uh, honed in on the two genes that um, were responsible for the reduced height and a lot of the, the gains that were made. But equally, uh, a whole array of alleles contribute to quantitative traits. So we have a lot of hope in genetic resources having solutions to, to climate change problems and to the yield gains that we need. And what is very different now from 50 years ago is the so-called genomics revolution that is happening. It's happening slowly, but it is happening. And it does change everything. So, uh, a lot of uh, past successes have also come from crop wild relatives and unexpected places. And if you look at the literature, they're, they're suggesting that more than 60 wild species ha in 13 crops have conveyed more than 100 beneficial traits. Now, this is from a paper in 2007, and I can uh, be sure that that number has gone up considerably. And it even came to the point when in a paper published in 2012 says that having looked at experiences in a large number of countries working on rice improvement, they were able to conclude that virtually any wild or unimproved accession has something to give to increase yields in crop improvement. So clearly, if you have all these important resources in one place as you do in gene banks, then you know you have something of value, even if you don't know quite yet how it will be used. And you might also argue that there is quite a lot we don't know about what is coming to us in the future. There's a lot of unknowns there. So gene banks to us present a very important set of options that we consider in the CGIR and, and the Crop Trust an absolute priority to conserve. And none of this, of course, would be possible without having a very solid and well-maintained global system for moving materials across borders. And that is the case with plant genetic resources. There is an international plant treaty since 2004 that facilitates the movement and the sharing of materials across boundaries. Equally, the CGIR itself is a corner is a, is a founding stone of that global system with its gene banks and with its germplasm health units that are the most important set of measures preventing movement of pests and diseases and equally information systems. 
So all of this is part of a very uh, uh, important founding in, in, in a global system. So now a little bit about the actual platform itself. The CGIR platform is, um, the GeneBank platform is, is the work of 11 CG centres under the um, management of two institutes, the CGIR and the Crop Trust. And uh, we, we were present as a CRP for the last five years. Only this year we have now transformed into a platform. And uh, clearly there's a, a, a role to play in answering to the sustainable development goals and particularly target two, which specifically mentions the need for soundly managed and diversified seed and plant banks at national, regional and international levels. So the platform came about as a word instead of the CGIR CRPs, as we all know, because it's not a research program. It is a, a, a body of work that is supportive to the core functions of the gene bank. These are the, the functions that are um, carried out by more than 400 CGIR staff to ensure that the seeds in these gene banks are um, correctly and appropriately stored and processed, acquired and distributed. And uh, indeed, it is a big job. So there are 756,000 accessions in the CG system, of which most are seed, but which there's a large number of tissue culture collections and whole plants in the field. We're talking about crops and trees. And every year, they receive more than 2,000 requests from outside of the CGIR, to which they respond by sending samplers, samples, giving advice, giving information, to more than 100 countries worldwide. So I read recently uh, something uh, written by an interview with the Secretary General of the UN. And uh, he said in any negotiation, you have two sides in the room. But in actual fact, you have something like six sides. I don't think this is new. I don't think it was him that made up this story. I think it's something that, that probably is very old. So you have the two sides who they really are, but you also have their perceptions of who they are, and you have the perception of the one side of the other. So in actual fact, you have six people round the table, and a large part of success in negotiation is about aligning everybody to the same reality. And I think that came through a lot in the, um, a theme that came through a lot in the talks this morning. It's about the context. How do you bring perceptions and aspirations into line with the actual reality? And a lot of what we're doing in the Gene Bank platform right now is exactly that. I'm sure you've heard plenty of times that the Gene Banks are the crown jewels of the CGIER. But how is that true? Is it true? How do we know it's true? These are the kinds of things that we're asking ourselves, and this is the uh, the origin of our work on, on quality management. It's about reaching high standards and showing evidence that they are reached. Many other aspects of the quality management are also important, including risk management, gains in efficiency, working towards improving processes, and very importantly, in a CGIR centre that's just reached 50, is the age of your staff and how close they are to retirement. So these things are all very uh, um, topical for today, and we have done a lot of work on, on quality management systems. And this shows also in the results. So uh, overall, in all of those 11 gene banks, we've seen a 25% increase in the availability of seeds in their storage. That's more than 100,000 of accessions are available now that weren't available in 2012. Um, equally, another aspect of aligning uh, aspirations or perceptions with reality is the work we've been doing on uh, seed quality management and cryopreservation. And we've been asking ourselves some pretty difficult questions. How long should seeds be in long-term storage? Do we really need to take them out and regenerate them so frequently? That's costly business. And we've had a lot of success with cryo-research. But how, how useful is it really as a tool, as a mainstream way of conserving? And these are the kinds of questions that your gene bank here in IITA have been uh, uh, tackling. And another difficult question. 
and that is how much diversity is actually in the collections. Do we need it all? Is there missing, is there missing stuff that should be in there? And this year I, 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 got, uh, I got wind of one of the uh, quotes that one famous uh, retired collector who will not be named, he said, if I had known the gene banks would keep and regenerate everything I collected, I would have been much more selective. So there's a lot of questions there that we are dealing with in, in our efforts to, to align with reality. And here is uh, um, some, of the, some of the things that have come out of the IITA gene bank and germplasm health unit in the, in the last five years. They've managed to uh, um, increase the availability of the accessions in their collection by more than threefold. I think that's more than any other gene bank. They've done a lot of work on seed longevity. They're looking at the viability of the seeds in their storage, and they have set up a brand new cryopreservation capacity, including, I think, the only liquid nitrogen generating plant for some distance, if not the entire region. I'm looking at Michael, not so sure. Barcoding, Green Global, that, these are all data management, uh, important quality control, um, things that have been uh, adopted. And, and very particularly, I think you might recognize these pair of green hands I hope you have. You had a phytosanitary awareness week recently, and Lava Kuma is the one to blame. He has been leading all of the GHUs in all of the CGIR in a, a, in a tremendous process of capacity development and improvement. And, and IITA is, uh, there he is, he's leading, leading the way in this uh, development in the CG, which is fantastic work. Equally, we have another story coming out of ICADA, very dramatic story that does prove that the concepts work. So the diversity that's been collected in the Fertile Crescent over the last few decades, conserved in Aleppo in the gene bank of Acarda. Fortunately, they made copies in the Svalbard seed vault, and now they have regenerated them. These pictures are of the uh, regenerated seed returned from Svalbard and now being grown in Lebanon and Morocco. I think this is graphic. Uh, graphic evidence of the ability of the CG to be resilient to these kinds of uh, crises that hit in these countries. I really do applaud them for this, as does uh, um, they've been recognized in many different ways. So, Anyway, that's the conservation side, but what is really important is how these materials are being used. At the moment, we are in a bit of an old-fashioned system where if you want to use germplasm or genetic diversity, you go to the gene bank manager or the curator and you ask, what shall I take? What's a good idea? They make an excellent guesstimate, but it remains a guesstimate. And then you receive your germplasm and you work on it. Now, the USDA, they did a bit of a study on this and they looked into how much of the germplasm that actually went out from the gene banks was useful. And indeed, an impressive 9% is integrated into breeding programs. And another 27% is evaluated, 14% is found useful in other ways, but a rather shocking 50% is actually pretty useless. And actually, uh, okay, yeah, that was my spectacular. Gen genomics revolution is on our doorstep. Um, and I think this is a, a case of fireworks. And, and actually, uh, what, what is important to recognize in, in this new uh, technology that is allowing us is to explore much further into the depths of the genetic resources in our gene banks. It's been called a, a virtuous cycle of discovery and our hope to turn gene banks into something more like discovery centers rather than <coughs> conservation banks. And the idea here is pretty obvious. You, you uh, manage to, uh, with the costs of genotyping going down so radically, you are able now to genotype quite large numbers of accessions. The bottleneck, of course, is the phenotyping. So once you are working together and able to phenotype as well, then you start identifying some pretty useful materials, some useful alleles or allele combinations. And then if you genotype yet more of what's in the collection, you can start predicting what is in there, rather than having to go through a process of phenotyping everything. Obviously, there are a large parts uh, of work that are needed to make this virtual cycle a reality. 
And, and we are working in the gene bank platform hard to, to, to start generating the momentum in this cycle, as we are, as are our, uh, our partners in the CG, in excellence in breeding, and, uh, and in big data, and of course in the, in the CRPs. So uh, a, large, a large part of what the gene banks can uh, contribute to this is, is developing the subsets that can be used in the, in the genotyping. Important also is being partners in the pre-breeding efforts so that we can start to explore what's in some of these crop wild relatives and unadapted germplasm. There's a lot more to be done on this and I'm not going to go into the details, but I think it's important to recognise that this is very much a self-perpetuating cycle and the deeper you go into the gene bank, the more we're likely to find. As a starter to this, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to tell you that uh, through the minting of digital object identifiers by the Treaty Secretariat in Rome, the CG centres have now put on unique identifiers into a large number of the accessions in their collections. These identifiers are intended to be picked up by the user, by the breeder, by, the, by whoever is, is the one who is receiving the germplasm, and they uh, modify the DOI but keep the, the, the root of the number so that now germplasm can be traced all the way to use back to the gene bank. Again, this allows us to hook more data, more information, more evidence back to the original accession and hopefully will uh, very much uh, feed into that virtuous cycle. Um, also, accessions are slowly but gradually being genotyped in, uh, in large numbers. This is the report that came uh, in 2016 from the gene banks. Uh, there's still a lot of diversity of methods and approaches and, and differences in, in resolution, but it's a start and it can only get better. So looking forward, for us, uh, conservation remains a major core of the work of the platform and a, a large focus for what the Crop Trust does. So there are a lot of strategic decisions to be made in, in the management and curation of these uh, collections. And potentially there is new diversity to acquire once we know better how diversity is represented in these collections. And of course, key to all of that is partnering in a, a global system of, of, of gene banks and users. In use, there's a lot we can do in terms of making new tools and data available to visualise diversity and to allow users to manage selections themselves. We have a lot of difficult questions to ask about what should be kept in gene banks and what of these new stocks and purified lines need to be conserved for long. And then we might look back at that question of how much trash, as one breeder put it in our recent gene bank meeting, is distributed, and that 50% is, for, should surely be something that should be reduced, so that distribution may not go up in numbers, but it should be more, uh, it should serve more what the user needs. And uh, finally, um, I do need to acknowledge very humbly my partners in crime, and that is uh, Michael Abberton and his team here, and uh, yes, we do. And I think if, if, if any applause come after this presentation, they should be doubled and sent his way, and to Lava Kuma, who are the implementers of this amazing collaboration. Thank you very much. Shalot, thank you very much. This is really enriching and uh, very thought-provoking also. I like your statement. First of all, I must say I'm happy to see that something really positive um, and visible has come out of this. Well, but um, it's always been known and call the, the doomsday vault. But there are several types of doomsdays that happens. And uh, for these materials now to be able to be brought back to Lebanon and multiplications going on, I think that's a very poignant uh, example of, of the importance of the work that uh, you and 
colleagues in this domain do. So thank you very much. I, I think at this point we would like to call, uh, okay, let me make a little modification. I like to suggest that we break for coffee. When we come back from coffee, we will call the three presenters on. We have 20 minutes uh, to have a bit of discussion and questions with them. Uh, we have 15 minutes uh, for coffee. It's uh, about 4 5 now, so 4.20, please. You should be, you've got to be in your seat by 4.15 so we can start. Uh, before we go for coffee, let me introduce Dr. Ilva Hilberg. Ilva, can you stand up? I don't know why you are clapping because I haven't told you who she is or why she is here. She may be here to arrest somebody. You know? Ilva is the former Deputy Director General for research. Uh, Elva left uh, us just in February. Yeah. So she left in February and uh, Meguri uh, took the mantle uh, from that. It's such a delight to see you. She was planning to be here since morning, but she, she was in some missions. I just spotted her now and I thought I needed to recognize her. Thank you so much. Elva. Okay, so let's break now. Let's go for coffee break. I will come back 4.20 exact to, to start the next session. Now the rapporteurs, the rapporteurs.